have Corinna. And I don't even have to ask if there's any good news this morning because Corinna is back from a long time away in the Czech Republic with her family. I, I was the happiest thing that happened this morning. I looked up and Pavlina and Corinna walked in the door and I said, good morning. And then they immediately went to work helping and making stuff happen here. So I'm so glad to see you all. It's a holiday weekend. Some people are on vacation, but we are here and we are going to worship and we're going to have a good service and you're going to hear some trumpet music later. Have you ever heard a trumpet before in person? I'm pretty excited about that. And I think we should get, go ahead and get worship started. Yes? Sound good? Sound good? I'm going to pour some water. You ready? Yeah, yeah. Very cute. He's not a hat, though. He's a fox. Yeah. He steps on your head. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I'm going to pour this water, and I'm going to read from the book from the prophet Amos, which some of us have been studying uh, this summer. And then Miss Pat will play the uh, organ prelude, and we will get worship started. Sound good? Okay. Amos writes, Let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Praise to you and peace, and welcome to worship here at Edgewood Presbyterian Church on this, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. For those of you who are with us on Zoom or watching later, those of you who are here in the sanctuary, welcome. Here we seek to provide a deep and abiding welcome. Welcome from wherever you have come. Welcome with whoever you bring with you. Welcome with your burdens, welcome with your joys, welcome to this household of faith, welcome to this service, worship, holy God. I invite you now to please rise in body or spirit and to join Sophia in the responsive call to worship. Sing praise to God, O faithful ones. Sing praises to our Lord. Sing praises to our Lord, faithful children of God. Hear us, O God, be gracious to us. Let us pray. Holy One, through Jesus Christ, you have come to this house to proclaim good news, to eat and drink with us, to bless us with peace. Equip us for your service, and then send us out as laborers to share in Christ's mission, so that all may be gathered in at the harvest of your holy realm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Friends, we have come here with burdens too great to bear alone. We've come here seeking authenticity and honesty and to join together in the redemption of a world that is groaning. So we humbly offer our own truth to the God of everlasting love. Let us join our voices together now in a prayer confessing our brokenness. We come to you in hope of being restored and healed. We have walked with our heads held high, without noticing others and their burdens. We are even unable to see our own. We keep silent when we could share good news. We keep silent when justice is trampled before us. We are so very overwhelmed, O oh God. Grant us listening ears, accepting hands, and open hearts to bear one another's burdens. Fill us with your peace and with your mercy. Free us from our failures. Free us to proclaim liberation. Restore us to a life lived. God, we now share with you in silence the burdens of our hearts. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. 
beloved of God, believe the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and restored to new life. Spring. Spirit of truth, breath of life, as the word is read and proclaimed, teach us what we need to know. Inspire us, breathe in and through us. Meet us with your fiery presence so that we may follow you without fear. Amen. Your community and individual testimony. Psalm 66 affirms the ancient story of God showing up to liberate God's people. Please join me in reading these verses responsibly. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Because of your great power, your enemies cringe before you. Come and see what God has done. God's works among mortals are awesome. God rules with power forever. God keeps a good eye on the nations. Let the rebellious not exalt themselves. wisdom, holy word. Our second reading today comes from chapter 10 of Luke's gospel. This is in the midst of a section in Luke. It's kind of the start of a section in Luke that is unique to Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel is known for being particularly interested in social justice, in righteousness, in looking out uh, for the folks who are not seen. The, the Jesus we meet in Luke is always walking into somewhere and saying, I see that person. You didn't see them. Look for them. Help them. That's going to fit what we hear today as Jesus speaks, uh, as he commissions some disciples. So let us listen for the, what the Spirit is saying to the church today. After this, the Lord Jesus appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no bag, no purse, no sandals, 
greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there. And say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off and protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. This is the word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Zucchini Graton. Zucchini Parmesan. Stuffed zucchini. Zucchini bread. Chocolate zucchini bread. Zucchini fritters. Zucchini pasta. Zucchini pizza. Zucchini cakes. Zucchini cake. Chocolate zucchini cake. Roasted zucchini boats, baked zucchini lasagna, grilled zucchini, zucchini crisps. You're not trying to set a record here for the most time zucchini has been said in a Presbyterian church service, though I bet we just did. That list is where my brain goes when I hear the sentence, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, I know it happens here in Alabama, but when I hear about the harvest, my mind's eye sees folks from in, uh, Minnesota and Illinois and Ohio who are stealthily depositing baskets of zucchini on their neighbor's porches and then scampering home victorious. They have provided a gift from their abundant gardens where they can't grow a tomato, but the zucchinis never stop. And they've given that gift, and that means that the tardy neighbor, the one who, who didn't act first, has their own problem now. They will have to give their own beautiful extra what in the world do I do with all this zucchini to an even slower neighbor? Maybe someone who's recently had dental surgery. Maybe the World Games should have a zucchini jettisoning competition. I, I haven't looked. They might. Uh, if you've seen the list of events, they might. Such a blessing, all this zucchini. There's another one. But truly, it's such a burden. There are only so many ways to enjoy zucchini before it ceases to be enjoyable. A gift, sure. But sometimes a gift given with the question, how do I impose this on someone else? Rather than, does anyone need or want this? Which are two very different questions. Jesus says there's a big harvest out there, but that there is a labor shortage. He has got a pressing need for some disciples to go do the work. It's urgent, y'all. So those who are up to the task have got to go without anything that would slow them down. No purse, no bag, no stopping to talk to chat. They have to remain focused on their work, on their work. 
focused on their labor, focused on the harvest. It's kind of exciting, the picture that Jesus paints. Kind of exciting, the idea that the world is just aching to hear the good news that Christ sends out. Doesn't that sound great? But this is the same Jesus who has told the disciples that he has no place to rest his head. The same Jesus who got run right out of Nazareth. It's the same Jesus who talks all the time about rejection and opposition to everything he stands for, brings, and shares. He tells the disciples how he will ultimately be spurned to the point of death. And even now, he says that he's sending these 70 like lambs into the midst of wolves. Harvest is plentiful. So much of the message of Scripture is about how the world doesn't know what to do with the word that God sends. The world just can't handle it. The covenant established with God's people at Mount Sinai, that covenant was odd and revolutionary. It was countercultural as it proclaimed that justice and equity are holy things not just holy things, but the holy things that a divine being, the God of the universe, cared about far more than being worshipped, far more than being given shiny stuff, far more than being told how very big and awesome they are. God's companionship for these people came with the expectation that these people would look out for one another's welfare. They would care for the ones who are struggling among them. That they would carve out particular space for the most vulnerable, for the stranger, for the foreigner, for the ones that the civil civil law overlooked or neglected. When God's hot anger in the scriptures, when God's hot anger is proclaimed by the prophets, it's because these covenant people, God's covenant people, have gone back to living like everyone else. To living selfishly and self-centeredly. They've gone back to ignoring suffering and they've gone back to oppressing the poor and the disadvantaged. They stopped sticking out and confusing the world. They stopped looking like weirdos everyone else. They've conformed and become too palatable to a world fixated on power and greed. God gets angry. So what we see is that befuddlement, confusion, or outright rejection and opposition is the expected response of this world to what God has to say. So if that's true, how precisely is the harvest plentiful, Jesus? Doesn't look that way to me. It seems to me that the religious landscape of both first century Israel and the 21st century United States, that on that landscape, we, Jesus folks, have way more supply than there is demand. Now, mainline Protestant denominations like ours are not having trouble keeping the t-shirts in stock. Following this section of Luke's Gospel, these verses here, we get the story that you will hear next week. No spoilers. But it is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And in telling that story, Jesus is going to do that thing thing he does so often where he upends expectations and he kind of breaks people's brains for a hot minute. It's what he does every time he talks about this confounding idea of the kingdom of God. This kingdom of God, which is somehow both far off and, and imminent. This kingdom of God, which is God's to bring about, but ours to make. 
real make manifest. This kingdom of God in which the usual measurements of what's rational and real and possible get pushed out the door in favor of plans that sound kooky and senseless and impossible. This kingdom of God. I think we're getting some kingdom logic here when Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. He is urgently sending disciples out to meet what he sees as a need and a hunger that must be met. No, the harvest is plentiful. We should go. They're saying they don't seem to want the zucchini. No, not that need. They don't need your religion. They don't need your beliefs. They don't need to get right with God in the way that you say they do. They don't need the things that you've decided that they need. They don't need the things that can be given without any actual giving. What are these disciples told to do? They're told to go and offer peace, to go be among the people that they meet, to share in hospitality, to build relationship, to heal, to offer hope, to focus on the needs of the people around them, and to bless those people through this sacred looking out for the ones who aren't seen, the ones who are on the margins, the ones whose cries are not being heard. Is there a plentiful harvest? you look at church statistics and trends, I think you might say no. But then you would be focusing on what is needed for us and for our community when Jesus sends us. You'd be looking to come away with something or someone to take home. That's not what we're being sent to do. Instead of looking at church statistics, figure out if there's a harvest out there. If instead you look at economic statistics, you look at the need for food and resources and health care, if the harvest becomes about kingdom work, work of justice and abundance, then, then y'all, there is more work to do than there was even just a week ago or a month ago. Here, within our borders, our state borders, our national borders, there will be less freedom in this country on July 4th, 2022, than there was a year ago. That is perfect. Mighty and terrible plans are coming to fruition to reduce or eliminate access to reproductive health care to reduce or eliminate access to medical and mental health care for young people, to reduce or eliminate access to the ballot box, and then to thwart the will of the people who make it their will. There is a growing yearning for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If the harvesting work is about bringing peace and reveling in hospitality, and building relationship, and offering hope, and blessing, and meeting physical needs, and finding ways to heal. And the harvest is plentiful today. That work is hard. Jesus sees wolves and projection ahead. Those are easier than ever to spot in our midst. I'm not informing you, you know, that a perverse form of Christianity actively works and organizes and mobilizes against life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, against peace, justice, and the way of Christ. Powerful people are seeking to take an unrecognizable version of this religion, an unrecognizable religion, one that ignores the prophets, and covenant language, and the Beatitudes, and Jesus' parables, and seemingly the entirety of the broad witness of Scripture, 
is seeking to take that unrecognizable religion and to wed it to the law, to the law of the land. They seek a regressive, racist, misogynistic state that does violence to anyone who isn't straight and white and cisgender and conforming to Victorian ideas of gender roles and sexuality. Now, six years ago, that may have sounded like I was a little perturbed and that you were being a little alarmist. Today, that is what is literally on the legislative and judicial dockets. Sit with our kingdom logic, our resurrection hope. These things that we know in our bones to be true, but things that we have rarely had to get into our bones to remember. This week I've been leaning on the words of theologian Frederick Buechner. Frederick Buechner did a lot of writing, and he managed to write both of these lines. He had a Bountiful garden. Bigner writes, what's lost is nothing but what is found. And all the death that ever was sat next to life and scarcely fell upon. And Frederick Bigner also wrote, resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. Neither of those is the line for which he's most famous. So he will have a great word for him. Maintaining hope through the night is crucial. We're going to get to see the dawn's early light. It's not a passive hope, of course, for the harvest is plentiful. There is work to be done. In these utterly terrifying times, we are left to pick our tools, pick our work crew, and head to the fields to see who needs peace, who needs healing, who needs relationship, who needs honest-to-goodness, non-theological, non-theoretical help. Some of that work must be loud so as to raise a ruckus and to proclaim resistance and to inspire other laborers and to call them to areas of need. Some of that work must be quiet, protect the vulnerable, protect the poor. When Jesus sees a world in deepest need, a world yearning for justice and freedom. He sends his disciples into the field, even knowing this way be wolves. Do not forget that he sends them in groups. Not alone. Do not forget that he sends them ahead where he, he himself, the flesh embodiment of God's love and grace, to go. So many are feeling alone right now or lonely. Look for other laborers. Look for work. Share hospitality. Speak peace. Pray. We pray for an abiding hope strength. We pray for courage. We pray for sustenance to spirit and body. Love and compassion. All the zucchini bread we can get.
Gospel according to John, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let us all now share the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. A few brief announcements for the community first. On the center aisle here, uh, you on the center side of your pew, you will find a fellowship pad. It will have some information for you to fill out, uh, fill out just so that you can let us know that you were here and how to be in touch. And uh, you can leave comments and tell me a joke or whatever and pass them to your neighbors so that they end up over by the stained glass windows um, for Kathy to pick up during the week. After worship, uh, despite it being a holiday weekend, we are going to march on with our Sunday school um, class on the book of Amos. We are in chapter 5 today with the most famous line from Amos. We started our worship service with it uh, about justice rolling down like righteousness. Um, and so uh, I hope you'll hang out. That'll be after worship. We'll take a few minutes, then we'll gather back in the sanctuary. We will be on Zoom, and it'll be recorded. Um, and we will talk about Amos for a little bit and then send everybody off to the rest of their Sundays. But the Castros, yes, yes, okay. The Castros have, uh, Elizabeth Castro has brought some popsicles to church in celebration. So uh, we've got a few kids here, and I bet there's a few for the adults too, after worship. Uh, find Elizabeth and Cedric and Giancarlo, and they will make sure that you get a popsicle. Thank you to the Castros. Uh, the church office is closed tomorrow for Independence Day. Thank you for, uh, uh, I can't imagine that you would show up at the church on the 4th of July uh, looking to talk to me about something, but uh, we won't be here, so thanks. Um, this coming week is a pretty uh, normal summer week, the normal comings and goings of meetings at the church and such. Uh, next Saturday, uh, uh, six days from today, myself, Rosemary Leach, two of our youth, a bunch of youth from the other churches in our uh, BYG Birmingham youth group um, and a whole bunch of uh, very patient adults are piling into a couple of vans and we are driving to Montreat, North Carolina for the Montreat Youth Conference 2022. Um, and so we ask for your prayers for traveling mercies, for uh, a safe trip, for nobody to get sick, for a good time, uh, lots of laughs, and then we will return the following Saturday. Um, if you want to know more about Montreat uh, and maybe go on a future trip or send someone on a future trip, come talk to me or any of the uh, youth or youth leaders, and we will tell you of this beautiful place and what it means to Presbyterians, particularly Presbyterians uh, here in the South. Um, that means that next Sunday you've got a guest preacher, and you, I, you are going to love her. Um, your guest preacher is the Reverend Heather Jones Butler. Um, up until recently, Heather had been the associate pastor at Emmanuel Presbyterian Church in Montgomery. Uh, Heather is part of a clergy couple. Her husband is a campus minister. His name is Rhett Butler. That is not a joke. Um, that is dead serious. Uh, you can ask her about it. She loves talking about that. Um, Heather brings more uh, energy and kind of goofiness and creativity than I've, you know, that, and she's got more of that in her right thumb than I've got. Um, in my whole career. So you're going to really enjoy Heather. She's an absolutely wonderful uh, preacher, and so you'll hear about the Good Samaritan from Heather Jones Butler next Sunday leading worship. But we will not have Sunday school next week. I did not say, Heather, could you also teach chapter 6 of the Book of Amos? No. So uh, next, next Sunday, worship, uh, Heather Jones Butler preaching. Also next Sunday, uh, after we took a, a month breather, we are back on the Feed Your Neighbors train. So next Sunday, we will need some folks to make lunches uh, Alice is going to send out a list. Uh, we'll include that in the weekly email of the groceries that we'll need for next Sunday. Uh, we don't need everything, but we need a few things. Um, and so uh, after church next Sunday, we will have a group that will make lunches, and uh, those will we make 41 lunches when we do this, uh, go to hungry folks on Monday morning. And what we're going to do for the month of July is do every other Sunday. And finally, I mentioned this last week, and I already got some uh, response, but uh, Cedric Castro Jr., who's sitting over here, 
uh, came to me with this idea a couple months ago of doing an art show this summer here at Edgewood as a fundraiser. And Amy Crow, wave your hand, Amy, is uh, also helping us put this together. We're still figuring out what it's going to be, but Cedric's working on art pieces. I know several of you have told me that you're going to uh, submit things uh, to answer a couple of questions that folks ask. They do not need to be uh, paintings or drawings. They could be sculpture. They could be photography. They could be kind of anything that that means to you in terms of art. We get creative here. Um, and then I did have a question of whether it had to be someone in the congregation. And no, the answer is no. If you know artists who would donate art, uh, please, please, please send them. Oh, and the third question, how good does it have to be? Well, you know, uh, it has to be what is meaningful to you, what you think someone would like to see. Uh, we, we have no, we're not going to be the judges of that. Send your art. Um, if I can come up with something, I bet you all can. It'll be great. So we'll be working on that. We'll send you more information. We're looking at an August late July or probably early August time to put that all together. Um, but let me know if you have any questions. Friends, we receive our offering via these plates that are coming forward, by an offering box in the back, and of course online, where you can give to uh, all the work and mission that this church does. Again, 10 cents of every dollar goes right out the door to mission partners. We also support the Matthew 28 orphanage in the nation of Haiti. You can make a special designation for those gifts. As the grace of Jesus Christ has been poured out for us, let us pour out our lives for others, offering our gifts and ourselves to God.
happens after the bread has been broken and the cup has been poured, I'll invite you to come down by the center aisle to receive the bread, tear from the bread and the cups, dip your bread in the cup, uh, either grape juice or wine, and then return by the side aisle as you partake. There's a contact-free station to your far left, and our gluten-free station then will have uh, on the far right. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. He gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were opened. They recognized him. We seek to recognize Christ at this table with us, Christ in one another, Christ in ourselves, as we share in this feast at this table, that is not Edgewood's table, not a Presbyterian table, but Christ's table, to which you are invited. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, O God. Your love is everlasting and your mercy is great. When we have rebelled against you, you sent your prophets to proclaim your word and call us to fix our eyes upon you. Therefore, we join with heavenly choirs and the faithful of every time and place as the people say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, O God, and blessed is your son, Jesus. He was born a child of Palestine, a, a brown-skinned child, the child of a teenage mom, a Jewish child, a poor child, a child born under the thumb of the emperor. He was a refugee. His family worked with their hands. He broke bread with the unclean, the poor, the cast out, the marginalized, the broken, and the brokenhearted. He was ordered to die by the government in conspiracy with religious leaders. But death could not hold him. The tomb could not contain him. Together, O oh God, we are his resurrection people. We are resilient. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these are gifts of bread and cup that the bread we break, the cup we bless, may be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be Christ's body for this world. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and one another until we feast with him and with all your saints in your eternal realm of justice and peace. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Now with the boldness of the children of God, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us in whatever language or version is most meaningful to us. We now pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our debts as we forgive our
you in prayer and we have some joys and concerns to share. Amy Crow asks us to pray for the family of Bradley Johnson, who was shot and killed in the line of duty in Baby Jones. So, pray for Bradley. Thanks for his service. Pray for his family. Friends, let us pray. Gracious God of love, we are grateful that you have revealed yourself to us. Each of us loved by you as children, each of us precious in your sight, each of us a reflection of you, each of us bound together by love, which is in fact your presence among us. We come to you, O God, weary and carrying heavy burdens. Some of us bear the burden of illness. Some of us bear the burden of loss and grief. Some of us bear the burden of caring for those who do not care for themselves. Some of us bear the burden of financial distress, the burden of hunger, the burden of homelessness, the burden of oppression and marginalization. Some of us bear the burden of violence and anger. Some of us bear the burden of depression addiction. From these and so many more burdens, dear God, we pray for rest. We pray for healing. For healing. To release. Fullness. On this holiday weekend, we recognize that our nation also bears many burdens. Struggle to trust our leaders. We fail to find ways to work together for the common good. We allow the least among us to suffer and languish. We lose our children to endless conflict, war, and violence. Remind us of our calling, our common creed. That all people are created equal. Inspire us to ensure that all of your children enjoy life, liberty, and happiness. Help us to be profoundly grateful for our freedom and security. We never take these gifts for granted. To use them for the betterment of all. God of all life, may peace and justice fill our land and indeed the whole world. We pray this morning for places where tension and violence is escalating, where people are victimized, where safety is threatened, where freedoms are denied, where life is treated as disposable. We pray with thanksgiving for science and medicine and caregivers. We pray for wisdom to prevail in those who might seek to lead us. God, grant us the yoke of Christ, binding us together, tethered by your love, guided by your presence, bringing your kingdom into this world. You have given us a foretaste of the feast of your reign, now by your spirit. Send us out to be bread for the world, so that all who may receive your grace may ever hunger and thirst. In Jesus' name we pray.
invite you all to have a seat for the last little bit here, except for Corinna and maybe Oliver and anybody else who wants to come hang out with me on the steps or the charge from the steps.
Nobody. 